So we are running a few minutes late, so if anybody does need to shoot off, I won't take it personally. So if you do, go on. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction to Kubernetes. Um, by the end of this, I hope you'll have enough knowledge about Kubernetes to go away and learn more about it if it interests you. I'm not going to cover Docker or containers or anything like that because there's just not enough time. If you don't know what, what a container is in this context, just think of it as a small shippable virtual machine that just contains your application. That's all you need to know for this. So, what is Kubernetes? Looking at the website, you get this. No <laughs> Bit further down, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. There's a lot of words in there, but still not really sure what it is. So I want to give you an analogy that I've stolen from a colleague of mine. I want you to think of Kubernetes as the captain of a container ship. Okay? And this looks a lot like Ed. I love, I love, I love this. <laughs> so each of these little containers is your Docker container or your containerized app. Uh, and each one is its own application. But this isn't strictly true with Kubernetes. What I really want you to do is think of Kubernetes as the fleet commander. Now, this, this Kubernetes captain has many, many container ships. Um, potentially thousands, potentially just one. Who knows? Um, but the job of Kubernetes is to manage each of these ships and, and work out what containers need to go on what. And, and if something happens to one of these ships, to resolve that. If one sinks, for example, God forbid, send another ship out with all those same containers on it. Okay? So I'm going to go over some core concepts of, of what you're using Kubernetes. So the smallest unit that Kubernetes cares about is a thing called a pod. Now, a pod can have one or more um, containers within it. But Kubernetes doesn't care about the containers. The smallest thing it will work with is the pod. And the pod is a single runnable thing, so a single instance of your application. Now, around a pod, we can have this thing called a replica set, which allows us to create multiple versions, not multiple versions, multiple instances of our application, so we can spread them out over, uh, say, multiple nodes and multiple computers that we've got, so that if one fails, we've still got more um, to, to pick up the slack. Um, so replica set will just say how many of a pod you want to have, so three here. Now around a replica set, we can have a very thin uh, deployment. Now all a deployment really does is it builds on top of the replica set, so you've still got how many of a pod you want, but it allows you to do rolling deployments. So when you want to ship a new version of your application, you update the deployment and it will handle bringing up the new pods with your new uh, app version and then take down the old ones without any downtime. So this is really nice, easy way of, of um, handling it. We've also got services. So a service is the way that you um, communicate with uh, your application. So a service knows, you, you point a service at your pods and it knows where all the pods are, how many pods there are and how to get to those pods. And a service will use uh, DNS as its, its resolution. So you can find different applications by an internal DNS lookup. And now on, uh, along with a service, you can also have a thing called an ingress, which allows you to create an external uh, host name that can then point to a service so you can host a web application or um, whatever. It'll point to that and then you've got your, your web page, your web app, whatever you've got. Um, there's also a bunch of other stuff that you can have that I'm not really going to cover. Um, you've got namespaces, which kind of um, I like to ring fence and stuff. Same search con jobs, configs, stuff like that. I'm not going to cover it in this because it's not really time. Um, the language of Kubernetes is YAML. JSON is also allowed, but you'll usually see YAML. Um, it, it does talk both. Pretty much everywhere you'll see YAML. Um, now on the, on the left here, we have a, a deployment. And on the right, at the top, we've got a service and then an ingress. And now the deployment, like I said, kind of wraps around that um, replica set and around the pod. So this kind of line here will effectively create a replica set that says we want three pods. And down here we've got the um, definition of what that pod should be. So we're saying we're going to use this image 
Uh, this, this Docker image, um, and this is some stuff that we need for it. And then on the right, the service, which we use a selector to say what to point at. So Kubernetes has this concept of labels that it uses quite heavily for uh, how you can find different resources. So if you wanted two versions of the same app release, so potentially you want to do, want to test a, a new version with a, with a subset of customers or whatever, um, you could have the same app name, but say like version two in here, and you can have another service that points to that. And then we've got our ingress that points to the service. Um, now this that you provide to Kubernetes is what's known as your desire state. You're telling Kubernetes this, all that's in this manifest is what I want Kubernetes to look like. This is, this is what I expect. Um, now I know what you're all thinking. Sounds totally cool, really, but why should I use it? Now, as I was mentioning to somebody earlier uh, during the break, it's not really necessarily useful for everyone, uh, but it's definitely worth looking into and seeing if it is useful for your team, especially if you're working with microservices, it gives you a lot of benefits. Um, the big one for me is the self-healing. So as I mentioned uh, previously, you've got this concept of a desired state. So the YAML that you provide your desired state, and what Kubernetes will do, it has this control loop that's constantly running that will check the current um, real-world state of your cluster and compare it to the desired state. If there is any discrepancy, so if there's more than expected or less than expected of anything, it will resolve that without you having to intervene at all, which is brilliant in the middle of the night when a pod randomly fails for whatever reason. Um, scaling is super simple uh, if you're using the, the deployment object, so you can just scale up or down uh, by just saying how many replicas of a thing you want, and then Kubernetes will decide, uh, sorry, will, yeah, will decide um, where to put those in, within your cluster. So you're in your um, multiple services, your multiple computers that you've got it running on, if one is quite heavy, uh, being quite heavily used of their resources, it will put it on one that's um, got free CPU and memory. And, and it, it does all that for you. You don't have to tell it where to put it. Um, kind of leads on to cost saving as well. Because Kubernetes is really good at working out how best to pack application, multiple applications onto a single machine, um, you can get a lot of cost savings from this by, if you have lots of little apps, run them on one fairly beefy server, rather than multiple EC2 instances or, or whatever you use. Uh, and Kubernetes will manage when you have low resources and shift things about. Um, you can vastly increase that if you know exactly, or even roughly, um, how much resources your app's going to use. You can put that in your manifest, and Kubernetes will use that and, and not let it use more than that, and much, much nicely pack things in. Um, as I alluded to earlier, you've got the service discovery, you've also got load balancing that's provided. Can you log in, please, Saren? Um, so you've got um, your service discovery that's um, um, handled using the services um, through uh, DNS, the internal DNS uh, resolution, and that also handles as load balancing. So if you've got multiple pods defined, so like we had three earlier, that one service will work out which of those pods to direct the traffic to to best um, balance the traffic. Um, and finally, one of the big selling points that's kind of a gotcha uh, is the portability of it. So it's meant to be, um, you run Kubernetes in your cloud provider, you can then take that Kubernetes setup and run it in a different cloud provider. So you can go from AWS to Azure, and your apps will just all be fine, because it's just Kubernetes, and they, they sell it as native Kubernetes. Now there is a bit of a caveat in that that we've come across in that a lot of these cloud providers like their own little flavor that they don't really tell you about. So we've hit one recently with AWS where you have to use their networking layer. You can't change that. And that networking layer won't exist in any other cloud platform because it's specific to how EC2 works. So just be aware of that. But other than that, the theory is you should be able to move it. Your applications will be able to move without a problem. It's just some of the cluster setup stuff different. And that's it. Thank you very much.